Please pray with me. Gracious and most holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As we begin today, our question, the question I would like to pose for us is, how do we know if our lives are well lived? This week, I was reading a book and there was a quote by Annie Dillard and she says how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives. What we do in this hour and that one is what we are doing. How we live our days and our lives, our hours, makes up our lives. So the question I'd like to pose this morning or today as you watch and participate in worship is how are you spending your hours, your days, your minutes here in this weird 2020 COVID season? How are you spending your days, your hours, your minutes? I was of course thinking about this because I think Joseph is an example of a life well lived. Today, we begin uh, by reading sort of the end of Joseph's story. Our scripture lesson skips to chapter 45, where Joseph and his brothers are reunited. But I'm going to begin by looking back a little bit at Joseph's story. Because while it is a story of forgiveness and reconciliation, it's also a lot more than that. As we remember, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And actually, he was a lot like his father, if you remember our series on Jacob. When we first meet Joseph, he's a lot like him. He's entitled, he's arrogant and rude. He is a know-it-all and a little bit of a tattletale. No one of his brothers likes him. And actually, they plot to kill him. And they throw him in a pit and prepare to tell his father that he has been killed when they decide to take the cash option and sell him to some passing Ishmaelites who are on their way to Egypt. So Joseph, the favorite son of the family, becomes a slave. And he works in Potiphar's house, who is a wealthy official and the captain of the guard in Egypt. As Potiphar's slave, the scripture tells us Joseph prosper. So as we read that, we have to wonder how this happened. And I think as we read and we infer into the scripture, what we see is that Joseph, along the way, learned from his experience with his family, with his brothers, and he learned humility. As a slave, I would assume that arrogance and rudeness would not get you far and would in fact just get you in trouble. And experience, I'm sure, as a great teacher. So Joseph learned to let go of some of his pride and his arrogance. And he became the overseer of the house, of Potiphar's house. He was in charge of everything. And everything under his hand prospered. And even Potiphar, the scripture tells us, saw that God's hand of favor was upon him. I wonder when we look back at our lives, do we see God's hand of favor? Do we see God's hand upon us as we made decisions and made turns and took new jobs and prepared to have a family? Sometimes I think when we're in the thick of it, in the middle of our circumstance, we miss God's hand and worry more about the details of what's going on. But I think it's important for us to look at, back at our lives and see God's hand in it. Because the better we are at recognizing God's hand, both in our past, but also in the moment, then the more we are able to learn to trust our God, even in the darkest of days, in the worst of our circumstances. 
when we trust in God, we learn that it is not our own abilities and the things that we bring to the table that matter. It is God's hand upon us. I think often, too, others who know God see God's hand in our lives even better than we do. So it's important that as the community of faith, we are speaking to one another words of life and hope and pointing out the ways that we see God at work in each other. I think it's a real blessing to be able to speak those truths to one another in love. Now, Joseph at this point in the story was alone and he was in a tricky place as Pastor Jim mentioned last week. Scripture says that Joe was handsome and good-looking. It also says that Potiphar's wife was less than honorable and less than faithful to her husband. She tried to seduce him daily, and he refused daily. But one day when she tried again, he left behind his cloak or his coat, and Potiphar's wife sought revenge on him and told the household and her husband that he had tried to seduce her. She lied, and Joseph landed in jail. When we look at Joseph's time as a slave in Potiphar's house, what we see is that his focus was not so much on his circumstance, on his lack of freedom, on his pain of being separated from his father and his family, he could have been downcast. He could have been depressed. He could have been all sorts of things. He could have run away. He could have seen only a dark future and hardship and lived in the unfairness of it all. Instead, what we see is that he worked hard. He was honorable. He was honest. He was trustworthy. And all of his master's property and holdings were blessed and grew under his hand. I think a life well lived means that no matter our circumstance, our focus and our perspective is a godly one. Our life is based not on what's going on around us, but what our God is doing for us and through us and in us. So bad went to worse for Joseph who's now in a dark dungeon. He is put there by the captain of the guard, and this dungeon is a place where all of the king's uh, prisoners were held. But again, Joseph finds favor even in the dungeon. The chief jailer puts him in charge of all of the prisoners. And again, he doesn't have freedom, but he does have purpose. He is able to use his gifts even in confinement. Using his skills then as a dream interpreter, Joseph helped his fellow prisoners and became known as one who was good at interpreting dreams. He used his talents and what he had to bless others, even in those circumstances. The other day I was in the grocery store. One of the few times we get out of the house is to go to the grocery store. Um, and I ran into one of you, and we were talking, and what I noticed as I came out of that conversation is that we spent a whole lot of time talking about COVID-related issues, teachers and children, and uh, our frustration with circumstances, and our readiness to get back to community and, and life outside the house. And I'm pretty sure somebody said the world was going to hell in a handbasket. I'm not even sure what that actually means, but we all get the gist. I wonder if it's the same for you though. A lot of energy has been spent in the past few months as our frustration has built and our readiness to get out has, has built up, that we spend a lot of time and energy on things that are less than positive. As the people of God, we are called to lift one another up. 
to point out the God sightings in our lives, to share good news with the world, to be light and life to all that are hurting. So as I came away from that conversation, I began to wonder how might we, with intention, change the narrative, change our own narrative, the narrative in our families. And I don't want to just say, look at the bright side, but I think looking at God's hand in the world and on us as, as his children is important. And we must do that with intention. I think the first uh, issue for us is that we have to see it. We have to be aware of what God's doing around us. You might have gotten an email this past week or two um, about an opportunity to share your own God sightings with the church. As we put together these worship uh, videos for the weekend, Cindy is always looking for uplifting videos of people at worship or nature or the things that lighten our hearts. So you're invited to, to send in those digital photos that we might use them in worship service. And I hope that one day we'll be able to have an art show and look at one another's God sightings in one way or another to share what God has been doing even in this time of separation. Because rest assured, God is at work. And I hope we are seeing it. I think the second challenge for us is, is to rest in the knowledge that God is doing something, even in this time. So back to Joseph. Joseph becomes renowned for his dream interpretations, and he is called upon by Pharaoh, who is having dreams that he cannot figure out and that are troubling him. So the Pharaoh is dreaming about famine and Joseph speaks the truth to him and says, you have a, this is what the dream says. And if you follow this plan, seven years of saving and, and storing up grain, there will be seven years of famine and people will come through it if you follow this plan. And the Pharaoh says, great plan. I like it. You're hired. And here's the signet ring and you are now, uh, in charge of all of it. So meanwhile, Jacob and the 11 sons are starving, as is most of the world around them. So they travel to Egypt to purchase some grain, and they meet with Joseph, who is now powerful and is markedly changed from the boy he once was. So the brothers don't actually recognize him, and as I think about that moment, I think, wow, what an opportunity. What an opportunity. After all the suffering, after all of the crazy journey, after all that he had gone through, the temptation to get back at them just a little bit must have been huge. It must have been huge. And the truth is, maybe he succumbed just a little bit. He did test the brothers to see if they were honorable and if they had changed. But when they passed the test, he revealed himself. He told them who he was. He weeps with them. They come together and they talk and the family is reunited. As we read the text, however, what we don't see is an actual moment of forgiveness, which is very interesting. And it's actually, I think, an amazing perspective on Joseph's part. So the brothers are expecting him to act harshly or at least um, demand some payback or something. But Joseph says, really, there's no need. There's no need even for forgiveness. Because Joseph says, as he sees it, God sent him ahead to save lives, to save their lives, and in fact, many lives. As God's people, I think a life well lived is one that has much to do with our perspective. Sometimes we think that a life well lived has to do with prosperity. The cars and the house and the job and the finances and all of those things 
that we think make us successful in this world. And while Joseph had that, what he truly had, I think, that makes his life well lived was a perspective, a perspective of God's work in his life, his hand upon him, a, a reality that was filled with hope, even in dire circumstances. God's calling us to look not at the dark circumstances around us, but is calling us to look to him. And not just live with our heads in the clouds, so to speak, but to live into the fact that he is our hope and our salvation. He is the way to live a good life and to have a white life well lived. Our challenge is in the thick of this life uh, to really pay attention to what we're paying attention to. To pay attention to where our energy is spent. Are we spending most of a conversation with someone we've not seen in a while to talk about COVID-related items? Or are we talking about the blessings that we've seen God lay upon us in this time? Are we talking about the way that God is moving in this world? Are we pointing out the hope that is in Christ? It's easy for us to want to look for cause and effect and to try to lay blame, and it is a surprise uh, when Joseph doesn't do any of that. Instead, he has a godly perspective. He looks at who has his hand upon him instead of the circumstances themselves. This life, this, this world, is not the end of all there is. We know this. We know this deep in our bones. But for some reason, sometimes we forget to point out the God sightings, even to ourselves. Joseph had a life of ups and downs, but his story is more than just about those ups and downs. It's more than just about his bringing his family through a famine, bringing his family into the land of Goshen to live. It's about the 12 tribes of Israel and Israel itself. And I don't mean just Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, but Israel proper. All of God's people throughout the ages were saved through this move of God's hand as they were saved through the famine, as the 12 tribes came to be formed and prospered, really, in the land of Goshen. The first part of the covenant that God made with Abraham is fulfilled in this story. They are not in the right place yet. And as Exodus shows us, they will go into the land of promise, which is more of the covenant fulfilled. And then, of course, the New Testament shows us the new covenant that is fulfilled in Christ. That it comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through David, to Jesus, and then to us as the children of God, those who believe in Jesus' name. Our challenge today is to really look at our life, our perspective. Are we living our best life? Are our moments and days, our hours well spent? Is our energy put in good directions? Are we sharing hope? Are we the hands of Christ to the world? Are we using our gifts? even in whatever circumstance we find ourselves, to bless others, to bless the world? Is our focus on good, on the good God that we serve? Is our focus on his hand upon us and his leading of us? Darkness and trouble will always be with us in this world. But also the hope that we have in God the Father, in a loving God, and in Jesus Christ his Son, is also always with us. When we look back, will we be able to say that our life was well lived? May it be so. Amen. Amen.